<laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining the Florida Food Policy Council's monthly Florida Food Forum, uh, hosted by the Policy Committee of the Council. Uh, I am Del Deshant, the co-chair of the committee, and Jennifer Parker um, is uh, the other co-chair, and Jennifer may be with us today, but I don't know for sure. Um, with us uh, for from the council is the council's administrative assistant, Kendra Love. Kendra will be handling the technical and managerial aspects of our meeting. I'm also asking Kendra uh, to let us all know when the session will close and give us an alert when we have five minutes left. So Kendra may, and she may uh, by, by all means uh, join us and offer uh, insight at any time. For now, this month's topic is food waste and food banks. And if you are not already familiar with the relationship of these two topics, food waste and food banks, today promises the excellent introduction. If you, if you are already informed on the topics, our session should expand and deepen your understanding. Kendra, I'm noticing a lot of static on the line right now. I'm going to continue presuming that I'm the only one hearing the static, but if others are hearing it, I apologize, and perhaps that's something that Kendra can resolve. Yes, I just uh, like everyone to go. Um, if you could please uh, mute yourself by pushing star and then six if you've called in. If you are online with us, uh, at the bottom of your screen, there is a mute button. Uh, while we're doing the presentation, if you could please stay on mute so we can hear our speakers. Uh, and then when we open up for a Q&A session, uh, you can unmute if you are calling in by phone by pushing star and then six again, or on the screen, if you're with us online, you can push the unmute button. Okay, thank you, Kendra. Hopefully that will resolve the static uh, and scratchiness that was occurring. Uh, it occurs to me that it's, and I'm getting feedback now too, just as a note. I'll continue. It occurs to me that it's possible that my introduction was not heard by anyone, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to repeat it. But I do appreciate Kendra's uh, directions on how the mute system works. Otherwise, it does make it difficult to hear the presentation. So thank you, everyone, for joining us for our topic this month, which is food waste and food banks. There is a document online introducing our topic for today. And you can go to the Council's uh, blog site and find information about the topic and its background, as well as our fine speakers. We do welcome David Vaina and Krista Garofalo to leadership of the forum this month. David is Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives at Treasure Coast Food Bank, and Krista is Chief Strategy and Advoca uh, Advocacy Officer at the bank. Following their presentation will be an opportunity for question and answer on the topic. And before going further, let me invite everyone here today to consider joining Florida Food Policy Council. You'll find information about membership on the web website, the Florida Food Policy Council is open to everyone, regardless of background and experience, as well as educational background in issues related to food policy. Everyone from professionals to lay people to just folks that have a passing interest in food issues are welcome to join. Please do consider this. And now as I turn things over to David and Krista, I ask that uh, to get things started, they tell us just a little bit about themselves and what inspired them to take leadership in this important area of our food system. And so with pleasure, please welcome David and Krista, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for that introduction. Um, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start first. I, um, I've been in food banking in about a little more than three years total. Um, in the two, I, I came back here in November about a year ago. Um, and in between that, I um, I was an education director for, for 
or organic grower. So I do have, you know, knowledge of, of um, two, ways, two different perspectives, both the grower perspective and then, and then where I'm now, the, the food banking perspective. Um, I got into food banking actually through policy, through um, the church of food bank years ago, um, had started at the local level, um, uh, hunger relief coalitions, I believe is what they were called, and Krista was chairing those. And so I did see the benefit of food systems works and dialogue and bringing together everybody that wants to, you know, all the different stakeholders, so to speak, I need a lot of lingo here, but um, I, I, I'm happy to be at a place where, where policy does matter. Um, and I'm happy to talk about food banks, but I mean, when I did work at, in, in sort of on the organic grower side and food system side, I, you do hear some criticism of food banking. Um, and one thing to remember about food banks is, you know, we, we, we traffic a lot of food. We, we, you know, we're in the food trafficking business. You know, there's a lot of um, sharing and sharing and, and recovering food or recovering and sharing food. So the scale, we're an important player in this. And I think it's sort of off people's radar, which is why I sort of wanted to, um, wanted to present it and, and you know, people I, th I think are starting to think about food banks as being part of the answer to sustainability. Um, I, I recommend everyone check out a piece that was in Food Tank a few months ago about how food banks can fit into the Green New Deal. Um, so there's some innovative thinking happening in the food banking world. Um, so I I'm, I'm, I'm want people to keep an open mind and, and realize that we are very mindful of this and 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 working you know, to to address both our, our you know, our traditional role, which is, um, you know, alleviating poverty and food insecurity, but also, um, you know, moving towards uh, a more sustainable framework. We're over to Kirsten now. Hi, everyone. Um, I have been with the Treasure Coast Food Bank and in food banking for a little over nine years now. Um, part of the reason I was brought on board here was to um, develop our hunger free coalitions. Um, that got started a little bit after I, I got here. That's how I met David. And, um, you know, it was a, an effort for us to really start collaborating more with non-traditional partners um, to be talking and having conversations with not just food pantries and soup kitchens, which are the traditional partners of food banks, but talking to organizations that serve children and seniors, um, talking to farmers and growers, talking to ranchers, um, talking to schools and all sorts of other institutions that normally are not involved in a conversation with a, a traditional food banking structure. Um, so that's kind of why I came on board. And, and it was definitely, um, you know, intriguing to me to come here and try to be part of a food bank that was trying to evolve and innovate in a way that was looking at the whole food system and seeing what they could do to um, you know, change the way that we're doing business to, to, to bring about change in the community in a positive way. Um, not just doing food in and food out. And, you know, there's a lot of food banks that do that. And that's maybe their, the, the role that they have in their community. And that's all their community needs. But that's not our community needed. So um, we have been, for the last nine years, sort of working towards, uh, you know, always looking at what we can do to be different and approach things differently and, um, you know, look at our role in the food waste um, realm and how we can be alleviating that some somehow in our community. So it's always been very interesting to me, this aspect of our business and, and how, and we've come up with some really interesting different ways to sort of, um, you know, work on that over the past eight, nine years that I've been involved. Okay, um, so we're going to start real, real elementary, and this is probably not new to, to most of you, but um, I'll just throw some, some pretty basic numbers here. So right now, about 40% of food produced in the U.S. does go to waste. Um, that's about 62.5 million tons of food waste every year. Um, monetizing that, that's $218 billion annually. Um, you know, growing, manufacturing, 
processing, distributing, and, and disposing of food that, that's never consumed. Um, breaking it down a little bit further, 10.1 million tons of food waste is left unhar unharvested on farms, and the other 52.4 million tons ends up in, in landfills. Um, so we, we looked at, so we just talked real briefly here about the source, but what's the endpoint of food waste? And, and this is important. Um, there's obviously waste at all levels of the food system, though it's not necessarily distributed evenly throughout the system. 80% of all food waste occurs in consumer homes and in supermarkets, restaurants and institutions. Um, and that's, you know, the supermarkets, restaurants, institutions, that, that's critical to understand. This is sort of why he was talking about these looking at food banks and, and you know, where's the food being wasted and where we traditionally interact with. Um, food banks have obviously long, long invested their food recovery efforts on grocery stores, um, Publix, Walmart, you know, the, in, in Florida, that those are, those are some of the retailers that, you know, we work with every day. Um, so you can see, you know, around the state, um, wherever you are in Florida, and really, if, you know, if anybody's from outside, outside of Florida, um, you know, these big, big, huge refrigerated trucks, um, like the one on the left on, on your screen is a, is, is a big one. Um, you know, going to grocery stores, receiving donated product, storing it at the food bank, and then, and then distributing it out through, you know, the, the smaller partner agencies that, that food banks work with at, at the neighborhood level. Um, we have a program here at Trevor Coast Food Bank. Um, I'm just going to give another example. There's throughout the state, you know, you know, anybody coming from Orlando, the second part of the food bank, they have their grocery rescue program. You know, these are these are core food bank uh, initiatives, programs that have been in place a long time and, and really do play a role in, in, in reducing food waste. And millions and millions of pounds of food are recovered and distributed. Um, you know, each year for this, for, for this type of system we have here. Um, nationally, the Feeding America Network is about, what, 200 food banks? I think, yeah, two, two, okay, so 202 food banks across the country collectively recovered and redistributed um, annually 4.5 billion pounds of unsaleable food. So that's a dent in, in, um, in the food waste issue. Um, so we talked about the traditional model with food banks here a little bit, but I wanted to talk about some of the more innovative things that food banks are doing. Um, there's a new, you know, sticking just with the retail recovery space here for a second, there's a, there's a new wrinkle, because we're not, you know, we certainly haven't been reaching everybody that all the retailers have that, that are, you know, contributing to food waste, you know, it's not really necessarily their fault, it's just part of the, part of the market, but, um, there's a program now called that, that we have in the food bank and other food banks are doing it. I think there's about 20 across the country. It's called the Meals, ours is called the Meals for Miles, um, nationally sort of known as the Meal Connect program. Um, this is a new and different approach to, to rescuing food from the retail space. Um, it, it specializes in just in time surplus food runs. As most of the donors, um, the food donors, they're, they're donating. And I'll talk about who those donors are. Prepare, are donating prepared foods, cooked meals, salads, sandwiches, which have an extremely short shelf life. Um, so ultimately, these these new types of donors are are the smaller retail chains, um, convenience stores, caterers, restaurants. Typically, food banks haven't always had the the capacity to do that. Um, and I'll tell you about how you know sort of how how it works, but. We're, so we're, we're expanding beyond just the, the big boys, so to speak. Um, it's also, what's interesting about it, it's a volunteer-powered initiative. Obviously, you know, food banks, the staff manages, but, but volunteers are trained in, in food safety. Um, they're provided with all the tools to keep the food safe prior and to during transportation from the donor to the aid, from the donor to the recipient. And they use their, they use their own vehicle. Um, these tools include thermal, you know, the tools are given thermal blank, blankets, totes, uh, infrared and thick thermometers, and obviously the documentation forms um, for tracking temperatures and the pounds received. And because we link the volunteers and the partner agencies directly with, with the donor, the food donor, the food is picked up in this trade and sometimes for just within hours. So assuring that no food goes to waste due to expiration dates and spoilage. 
Um, and because the volunteers are are the you know really the personnel here, along with you know some some management here from from the from the paid food space, it really has the potential for us to be even more good food from retailers than if we exclusively relied on paid staff. Um, so we're going to look like uh, we're going to look at some food banks in different parts of, of the country for, for a second here and actually go to go to San Diego. Um, you know, we all know that that this is probably not news to you, but, you know, food waste produces methane and, and you know, well documented his contribution to climate change, polluted waters. We all know that in Florida. So the San Diego Food Bank, they they put into place a zero landfill food waste goal, their, their organization. Um, at the heart of this goal is, is a, um, they've, they've self-financed a, a rotary drum composting system that was introduced in late 2015. Um, the composter has the capacity to compost 2,000 pounds of food per day, and that's what you see on the left of your, of your screen. Um, so to the traditional grains, you know, that are that are part of the composting process, the food bank adds food shavings or cardboard and compost and in turn produces compost in as little as, as five days. Um, that compost then goes to local farms and community gardens in the San Diego area. Um, as I said, they, you know, they, this was an investment for them. They, it cost them $200,000. Um, I'm sure we would like to have one one day as, as well. Um, but that's another you know, that's another model here. Um, and of course, you know, this is a food policy talk and this is the policy committee. So, you know, just to give you a little bit of context, a little political context, um, California earlier in the in the decade, um, soon to be new decade, but California has an assembly bill that they passed that requires businesses to separate food scraps specifically for organics recycling. Um, and that's all part of California's statewide goal of 75% like of, of 75% recycling, composting, and source reduction of waste by, by 2020. Um, Vermont Food Bank, um, they have the state's, they actually have the state's largest gleaning program. Um, 600 volunteers are involved in that. Um, and I know locally here down in, in South Florida here, there are some some people in the in the uh, food recovery business, food pantries that do do gleaning as well. I'm sure in your area they as well in your area gleaning opportunities as well. Um, more context, Vermont has a universal recycling law that requires by 2020 that all organic waste produced in Vermont, including food waste and yard debris, needs to be needs to be diverted from landfill disposal. So let's come back to, to Florida. I know we always get a little bit geography envy when we talk about the sustainability initiatives and um, you know California, Vermont, you know, how realistic is it in our in our state to do things well? You know, maybe maybe not, but um, always always like to think big. Um, so in Florida, the the states the state food banks um, there are what 14 food banks in the state. Um, they're part of uh, of a coalition called Feeding Feeding Florida, and there's a, pro, a statewide program that's called Farmers Feeding Florida, and that's supported, that does get state support, um, and there's also a tax deduction for farmers as well. How does Farmers Feeding Florida work? Um, it, it's a system that's been put in place specifically to help offset the cost of Florida-grown crops that can't be brought to market. So about 20% um, of produce in Florida doesn't make it into, doesn't make it into the supply chain. Why um, this shouldn't be news to you, but, but you know, cosmetic reasons, market shifts, those sort of things. So what Farmers Feeding Florida does is it helps farmers find the market, and the market are the food banks. Um, so in other words, a market is created by distributing that that 20% of, of produce that that I just mentioned. Um, that's distributed through the food banks and then through the state. And how how do the farmers benefit? Well. The, the program helps them with their pick and pack costs, you know, packing materials, and it pays the farmers a pick and pack out fee. Um, it's, a, it's a terrific program. Um, of course, the, you know, the challenges aren't so much with, with the food bank, but, you know, when we see this all the time is with the smaller, you know, our partner agencies, 
them lacking the capacity, you know, refrigeration, that sort of thing to keep, um, you know, to keep food fresh. But it's, it is a tremendous program, or, you know, really we call it win-win in the business for, um, you know, bringing, bringing fresh food into, into the local community. Other states have these. Um, in Kentucky, there's the Farms to Food Bank program. Um, that helps, you know, that works with, connects farmers and, and the food insecure population. Um, you know, and as I said, it's a it's a win win. So, you know, when I was at for organic growers and just out with you, you know, you do hear, oh, you know, food banks are, you know, they're part of the problem. That's what people tell me and everything else like that. But they don't know that, you know, it's sort of a an older way of thinking and, and not so accurate. As you think about the I think we're hearing somebody. Hi, I think um, for those of you who are on your phones and not on mute, uh, just a reminder to push star and then six. Uh, and then later after the presentation, you can unmute yourselves again by pushing star and six to participate in the discussion. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, it's a it's it's a win-win. Um, you know, beyond the support to Florida's ag community, you know, I was talking about sort of the criticism. I think it's you know, is this this really large infusion of, of Florida-grown fruits and vegetables into the communities um, where where there are still high rates of food insecurity? Um, as many of you know, there is an inverse relationship between good health and food insecurity. People that are food insecure are typically, um, you know, like experiencing type 2 diabetes or heart disease or, um, you know, obesity, things like that. Those are all issues that the food insecure population experiences. Um, so just talking about my our, our food bank for a second, you know, in just the last year, um, either through this program or through um, purchases that we've made directly through farmers, um, we share more than 3 million pounds of Florida grown produce, um, either through directly with our partner agencies or through, through the Farm to School program. Um, and we, in addition to this, the next slide here, is we've gone, you know, we get the food and, and you know, as I was referring before, referring to before is, you know, there's some of the capacity issues that our smaller partner agencies experience. Well, we looked at that you know, that challenge, and it's one easier, you know, it's not the easiest thing to fix. Um, a lot of these smaller agencies just don't have the capacity to fundraise, and they don't have the space, and, you know, these people are doing, different, you know, they're doing other things, there's a church, and there's other areas. So, Food Bank, this is actually, what you see on the screen right now is our old Food Bank, it doesn't look like an old Food Bank anymore, it's, a, it's our production kitchen. Um, it's a 10,000 square foot facility, um, and what, with all this, equipment and on the left is a um, is the executive chef that's that's part of the team there we're able to process prepare file back and and flash freeze produce um and, and other you know other food as well so extending that shelf life so the food that we can't get out the fresh food that we can't get out immediately well that will have a second chance that'll have another life beyond that and and and, you know, we're, we're pretty unique for, for doing this. I know around the country there are some other people that have started these production kitchens. So, again, this is um, not maybe not what you think of when you think of food banks. So I've wrapped up um, sort of the program discussion of things. And Krista, I'm going to turn it over to Krista. She's, um, you know, our, our, our policy guru. So she's going to she's going to take over from here. Thank you, David. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, different policies that allow us to do a lot of this work that David was talking about. Um, there, there needs to be uh, definitely protections against liability for the donor in order for this to all work at the level that it is working at. So um, one of the things, one of the biggest policies in place that allows us to protect the donors and to um, really encourage them to uh, be a part of being a donor of uh, excess produce or um, any sort of food product whatsoever is the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act. Um, under this bill, corporate donors are protected from liability. Um, as long as the donor has not acted with negligence or intentional misconduct, 
the company is not liable for any damage incurred as a result of illness. Um, this was a bill that was passed um, by President Clinton and um, it's really helped us in being able to recover as much of this product as possible as opposed to it being um, uh, plowed over or taken to a landfill. Um, there are tax benefits for both individuals and businesses in donating food to food banks and other food entities. Um, there are also expanded um, benefits as of 2016, uh, particularly for um, donations of fit and wholesome food. Um, any inventory that, to, that goes to a qualified 501c3 nonprofit serving the poor and needy. Um, the qualified business taxpayers can deduct costs to produce the food and half the difference between the cost and the full fair market value of the food donated. Um, and it applies to C corporations and non C corporations. And as of 2016, there are new procedures for growers that are using um, uh, cash accounting. Prior to the expanded tax law of 2016, um, tax deductions, uh, these enhanced tax deductions, were not available to farmers and growers that were doing their accounting on a cash basis. It was only available to those doing accrual accounting, which tended to be a lot of the larger farms, but not a lot of the smaller local family farms. So um, because they were able to expand it into um, allowing for a you know, people that were doing cash basis accounting to donate and get a deduction, that has significantly increased the amount of people that we can talk to about this program and being a part of um, donating to us. Um, the cash accounting method, there's a little bit of a different way to calculate the deduction. Um, and, um, but there is still the ability to participate and receive that deduction, which we were very, very happy when that, when that happened. Um, by expanding the applicability of the tax benefits to all farmers and producers, and by making it permanent, it allows the farmers to incorporate donation as a regular part of their crop planning, either grown to donate or as an outlet for unmarketable product. Um, we have seen in the past because of the enhanced tax deductions that it's not just I have this product and it didn't grow to the right size. And I can't sell it to the grocery store I was um, growing it for. Can you come get it now? It's well, we're doing this and, and it's a great program to be a part of. We're going to set aside a certain amount of land and we're going to grow specific products with the intention of it solely going to a food bank or a food entity. Um, because they know that they can get that tax deduction. Um, the, it also um, provides a protocol not previously available, which establishes a fair market value of the product donated from the farm or the packing sheds um, by utilizing the selling price of goods moved to market. So um, it really helps them really understand going into it, um, you know, what the deduction is going to be, what the benefit is going to be to them, and they can plan accordingly for, you know, what they, what they're able to do, um, with their fields and also, um, financially as well. So it's, it's been a great, um, way for us to sort of talk to people about being a part of making these donations, um, not just saying to them, Hey, don't worry if you donate something. And we know that the intention is good. You know, you're not going to be liable, but also you're going to get this benefit for doing it. Um, and like David said, it's a win-win situation when we can do that because we can um, protect them from liability. Um, you know, they can get a tax deduction um, that's beneficial to them being able to continue to um, uh, create revenue for their for their um, for their farm. In many cases, a family farm, a legacy farm. And we get the product to be able to share with our clients and with um, different people in need throughout the community. So um, there's three basic requirements for the businesses to meet in order to receive the tax deduction. Um, the recipient organization must be a registered 501c3 um, that receives food specifically for those requiring medical care or those living in poverty. Um, the recipient must use the donated food in accordance with its mission. Um, so, for instance, you can't, they can't donate the food here to us uh, or any other organization and we can't use it to have like a staff Christmas party. Um, it has to be used to, to um, uh, enhance our mission and be a part of our mission of, you know, feeding people in need in our community. And then the organization receiving the food may not use the food in exchange for money, 
other property or services. Um, but there's a important exception to this. An individual in need that is receiving food assistance cannot legally be charged for any uh, obtaining any of the food, either directly through us or through our partners. But we can um, charge a nominal fee to the entity that is receiving it from us, say a food pantry or a soup kitchen, to reimburse the organization us for administrative warehousing or other similar costs. Um, that's important because it's um, we have a dozen refrigerated trucks that are out on the road every single day picking up food from a variety of different sources, whether it's retail stores or local farms. Um, you know, they need to be maintained. They um, they need fuel. And then when they bring back um, a lot of the fresh perishable product here, it needs to be refrigerated. Sometimes it'll be um, you know, certain product is frozen. Um, so there's a cost to that. So um, it's a very, very, very minimal amount of cost that we are um, asking our partners in this, um, you know, in our feeding programs to incur in order to um, uh, be able to provide these, these products to people. I will say that our produce, um, none of our produce goes out with any sort of shared maintenance or handling fee. And it's not because that cost isn't there. It's because we feel that with produce, our fruits and vegetables, it's so important for the health and nutrition aspect. Um, and because of our partnerships with our local farmers and growers, um, we, we want to encourage people to take that product and utilize it as much as possible. Um, so that is not something that we uh, actually do any sort of um, fees for. Um, we also wanted to talk a little bit about policy reform at the federal and state level. Um, first at the federal level, there's um, HR 3981, the Food Date Labeling Act of 2019. Um, this bill, which was introduced by Representative Shelley Pinigree and Representative Dan Newhouse, seeks to standardize date labels across the U.S. in order to address a very confusing system of sell by, use by, and best before dates. We get a lot of questions about that from both clients and partners. Um, so there is a bill out there that's trying to clarify that for people. Um, currently, most food dates only indicate the peak quality of a product, and thus millions of tons of food is unnecessarily thrown out. Um, there are estimates that suggest about 90% of food in the U.S. is thrown out prematurely due to the confusion from food labels. So the bill has been referred to the Committee on Energy and Commerce and the Committee on Agriculture, um, both of which include members from Florida's congressional delegation. Um, at the state level, there are um, about seven policy areas where there's opportunity for further addressing food waste. Um, one is uh, further tax incentives, um, liability protections. Um, the Emerson Act provides a federal baseline, which states cannot remove, but um, states can offer additional liability protections. Um, date labels, educating the public, for instance, on the meeting. Of a, of a date label and, and how to navigate that until the federal level gets a little bit of resolution on that. Uh, food safety. One idea is to have health inspectors serve as ambassadors and provide handouts to food businesses during the inspection process. Um, we have opportunities with schools. Um, funding for schools is needed to conduct food waste audits and to incentivize schools to move to trailer dining. Um, the University of Florida has moved in this direction, and one pilot city of a college found a 25% reduction in food waste when going to trailers. Um, organic, organic waste ban and recycling laws. Um, in Vermont, by 2020, all organic waste produced in Vermont, including food waste and yard debris, as, as um, David mentioned before, um, be diverted from landfill disposal. Um, you know, this, do we have the support to do that in Florida? It's definitely worth looking into to see if there's, if there's a, a way to get that in front of the Florida legislature. And last, um, just general government support. This could be more education, more investment in technology and infrastructure um, in, you know, if an organic waste ban and more stringent recycling laws were passed. Um, so those are just a few of the things that we'd like to see happen when it comes to policy. I'm going to turn it back over to you. <laughs> and now, so we, we're on the question slide, as you can see, and we're, I, I, we're proud to have put, um, we recently were awarded a snail of approval, uh, our food bank for um, 
and art from them in different ways. So I think, unless someone else knows differently, I, I, I think we're the only, um, maybe we're the only food banks. Uh, I think definitely the only one in Florida, but I don't know about nationally. I, I did send an email to the media people at Slope that haven't heard back, but um, we're proud of that and, and um, we're trying to, you know, strengthen our, our, our partnerships with, you know, with the, the Florida sustainable community even more. And that, that wraps up. We're happy to take questions now. Okay, very good. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you both. Um, exciting and dynamic work that you're doing and wow, really making a difference. I uh, commend you for that. I'm gonna open it up for questions uh, from ever, from everyone that's online. So uh, please, uh, Kendra, if you can open up the line so that our uh, participants can share questions with our presenters. Okay, so just as a reminder, um, if you would like to ask a question, just push star and six to unmute yourself if, if you've called in or at the bottom of your screen, you can click the unmute button. I do believe we did have uh, one question from Whitney. She wanted to know if you could um, just once again, tell us the names of the policies that you shared today. Um, the the main one that we discussed was the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act. Um, that's the one um, that protects donors from any sort of liability in the donation process. And then um, you know there were a couple of other uh, specific bills that we brought up, which was HR three nine eight one, which is the Food Date Labeling Act of twenty nineteen. And then the, the state ones in um, in the California. Oh, let me pull that up. That was um, I'm sure it has another name, but the California one is Assembly Bill 1826. I don't know what its you know its, its common name is, but uh, 1826 California Assembly Bill. And then um, Vermont has the Universal Recycling Law. And was there also another one uh, specifically related to yard waste that is um, being reviewed right now? I think that was the Vermont one. Oh, correct. Yeah. Well, yard debris. Yes. Yeah. Food waste and yard debris. Right. Chris said that. The, that's the Vermont. Um, the Universal on Vermont deals with uh, uh, yard waste. Yard, yard debris. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, well, if anyone else would like to ask a question, um, you can unmute yourselves by pushing star and six. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabby Teixeira. Um, thank you so much for all this information. It's been really interesting. I was wondering, I started to reach out to restaurants and Sharing, for example, the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act that I found many facilities and um, companies don't know about. And I wanted to hear from one of you if you had maybe any other pointers when we talk to restaurants on how we can maybe connect them to food banks or if that connection is even possible. So I guess my question is twofold, right? Is there a relationship? And sorry if I missed this earlier is a relationship that your food bank has with restaurants? And if so, what can we do to maybe um, connect restaurants to, to your bank? That's a really good question. Um, some organizations, um, well, some of the chain restaurants are a, uh, a part of a, um, a food rescue program called Ample Harvest. Um, so many of them are working directly with their food banks through that program to recover some of their food. But if they're not a part of another program, <coughs> excuse me, and you are interested in talking to them about um, possibly having the food bank do food rescue at the restaurant, I, the best bet would be to call your food bank and make sure that they're able to handle that type of uh, donation. Um, a lot of the food rescue from restaurants, it's, um, it's not a huge quantity of food. 
And that doesn't mean it's not worth rescuing. It's just that sometimes they don't have the capacity to do stuff like that. If they don't have, say, a Meal Connect program in place, um, like we do, where we can, you know, we can have volunteers go and they bring their own vehicles. So obviously they're not utilizing big, huge trucks. Um, and so picking up a very small order of food is, is like, that's what they're here for. Um, and that's what they're doing so that staff can focus on the sort of larger scale donors. Um, so my suggestion, if you're not with a food bank, is to reach out to your local food bank, see if they're interested in you making that connection for them. That would be first and foremost, find out if that's the case. They may refer you to one of their partner pantries. Um, I know that in the past, before we had our Meal Connect program, people would call us about that. And what we would do is that we would ask one of our partners, would you be willing to go and pick up this food and report it back to us? And, and that's sort of how that operated. So, um, cause we didn't want to deny a donor that was interested. If you have a donor that's interested, you want to make that connection possible no matter what. Um, so I would say the first step would be to contact your food bank. If they are interested and they're, you know, um, you're interested in helping them make that connection, um, you know, having the Bill Emerson uh, law with you is very, very important. Um, you know, letting them know that, um, you know, that there are tax deductions available for that. And um, there is a good resource that I neglected to mention if they have specific questions about how their tax deduction will work. Um, and it, you, you can go to the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic's tax food donations legal guide. They have it on their website. Um, you can get very specific details of just exactly how their tax deductions would be conducted if a uh, sort of sticking point with them would be exactly how am I going to benefit from this and what are the tax implications and all that kind of stuff. Um, it would be also helpful just to remind them that, you know, there are people in the community that um, are in need of food and, you know, that would be able to allow you to rescue that food and provide it to a family in need. Um, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of thing that from a marketing perspective, um, a lot of people will probably appreciate that and potentially um, want to give them more business because they are involved in um, some sort of a program like that. It's getting involved with a nonprofit organization, um, making charitable donations um, like that is definitely seen by customers and potential customers as a, a benefit and maybe could be a reason why they choose that restaurant over another one. So you can always bring up the, the marketing and the public relations opportunities that would be available. And I don't know if David has any suggestions. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, I know that, um, you know, often restaurants need to make donations at 11 o'clock at night, you know, and, and again, it's, it's you know, that's where volunteers can come in and, and uh, you know, and help support the food banks. So we're already sort of stretched in terms of resources to begin with. So it's easier said, it's easier said than done, but, um, you know, again, the Meal Connect program is great because it sort of miniaturizes and, and, and uh, you know, the, the system a little bit and, and makes it a little bit more flexible and mobile. But, yeah, where are you located in Florida? I'm in Miami, um, specifically Sunny Isles. Okay. Um, so that would be like feeding South Florida. Feeding South Florida. Yeah, feeding, feeding South Florida, yeah. Mm -hmm. South Florida. Yeah, if you reach out to them, they have a pretty good website that you can get some contact information off of and you can give them a call and just see, you know, talk to somebody there about um, working with them on that. Um, Miami is probably very, um, a very good market to be doing that. They have tons of great restaurants down there and, um, you know, it, it, would be, it would be significant for them um, in terms of what they could potentially rescue. Yeah, definitely. I, and as a follow up, do you work by any chance with Whole Foods or Publix, any of the major markets? Um, we, yeah, we work with uh, Publix. Um, and we, you know, in terms of, you know, through Feeding America, because remember Feeding America, we were part of their, you know, national retail store program. 
Um, and so Publix is a part of that. Walmart, Wendy, um, Aldi, Save a Lot. Um, Whole Foods is a part of it. We just don't happen to have any Whole Foods in our area, unfortunately. Um, but I do believe Whole Foods is a part of that program. Um, we would love to get food from Whole Foods. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, but yeah, we work with most of all the, the national retail store chains, um, uh, through that partnership with Feeding America. Um, and then we're rescuing uh, a lot of food from those, those retail stores on a weekly basis. We do pickups at some stores two to three times a week. Um, and you know, the smaller stores, maybe they don't, they don't get picked up as much, but there are some places that were there a couple times. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Hello here. Uh, anybody hear me? Okay, we can hear you. Oh, yeah. hey. Paul Murphy in Sarasota. I was wondering, where is that uh, compost machine located at? The one that was said to be a $200,000 um, item? San Diego. San Diego. Okay. All right. Is that a county? City or what uh, business was that? I'm it's the county and the city. Uh, I county guess. City? Take county? Yeah. Okay. I, I, assume both, I assume it's both the county and the city. So we started this composting, residential composting in Sarasota County. Uh, we usually just teach people to use the bins and how to compost at home. Uh, we're still spreading that around. And then the county also starts doing uh, composting at all the county events. And uh, we're even going to large areas, but even locally, we're starting to do zero waste events. Like I'm hosting a zero waste Thanksgiving and uh, composting all that with compostable plates and stuff. And I will be taking any food that's left over and uh, feeding the, um, the, the, the volunteer and the full time fire um, fighters that are at the fire station uh, at the location that we're uh, going to. And anything I don't, you know, that we don't, that I'll probably take home, eat myself, or try to reduce as much compost. It, but it's a, it's an individual city, state, nation, and global thing. It's di different levels for everything, and trying to get each one to do it. Tropicana sends all their oranges to get, you know, juiced at their company, and then they use the rinds, get sent to a, a compost facility, who then sells it to another place that mixes it with other stuff to make a organic fertilizer of which I believe they sell it back to uh, Tropicana for. So there's a closed loop system there. But this needs to be like something at every single level about food waste. And I think the biggest waste of food is, is the meat industry where, you know, being vegan, I see so many millions of chickens and cows and pigs being uh, buried in uh, mounds because the, of some disease or you know, recall or whatever it is, or a train wreck, you know, whatever the case is. Um, I, I'm not, you know, for that kind of stuff myself, but there is a, a big kind of food and ethical thing going on there. Um, but I'm not sure what other policies would be in place for stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you brought up the you brought up a great point, and we, we talked about it a little bit briefly. It's just you know where the state can come in, or or some you know uh, Dade County, the city of Miami. I mean, they're going to have resources, you know, to sort of build the infrastructure that's needed for composting on a really large scale, um, and that's really where some investments can be made, you know, with, with tax dollars, um, you know. But there's, as I, I don't know a lot about composting in terms of the business model. I have seen some some people that are turned them into business leaders and things like that. Um, but you know, it it's hard to ask the the nonprofits to invest in that. But that's where the state can certainly play a part. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next question, moving on. Next question, uh, Kendra, am I, am I on the line? <clears throat> yes, you are, Adele. Just asking for further question or uh, comment. Okay, I don't see any 
coming up. So let me just, um, I want to, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to just check. Can you hear me? I'm oh, sorry. I had a speak. Oh, Go um, ahead. This is, is Jen with the Central Florida. Question, um, as far as the uh, Florida uh, Policy Council goes, how, um, how I guess, um, how much of an understanding do you have when it comes to food waste um, with the current Florida's uh, food waste diversion goals and where they are at with that? Uh, speaking for myself, I'm unfamiliar with where the state is in that at all. If there's someone else from the Policy Council that's aware of that, I'd welcome them to uh, share. So there you go, crickets. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't have. Uh, I just. I don't know where the state is on it. Um, I. I my, my my suspicion is is that they probably have not advanced the ball very far on it. But that's not a. That's not an informed statement. Absolutely. I'm just wondering if maybe perhaps there's some um, value in, in at least um, getting behind that a little bit more um, and helping move that needle. Oh yeah, um, I, yeah. I, I couldn't agree with couldn't agree with you more on that. I do not know the the mechanisms that the state has put in place to uh, accelerate or advance that initiative. I don't know what this. Honestly, I do not know what the state is doing to try to advance it. I do not know if the state has put any funding behind it. If you know about that. That would be very helpful. Uh, that'd be very helpful to share. I'm just not familiar with what kind of funding the state. It could be an unfunded initiative, but I don't know on that. It's not a. That's not a public statement. That's not an official statement. It's just a hunch that I have. Oh yeah. No, I know that. Um, in the last few weeks, the FDA, USDA, and the EPA actually announced a, a really amazing partnership um, and created the Food Waste Reduction Alliance. I imagine if there was not funding prior to that, that I'm sure that there is going to be funding behind that to support that initiative further. Um, and that's a federal program? Um, that's a federal it is actually a, um, a team up with the FDA, USDA, and the EPA. Uh -huh, it's so called, uh, it's, called, uh, it's called the Food Waste Reduction Alliance that was just formed. The, um, and and so that's being driven at the federal level, then, correct? Yes, and I'm um, sure that it's going to trickle down. Um, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, to all uh, Chris, that's Krista talking. Kirsten with Second Harvest Food Bank uh, of Central Florida. Uh, um, do you have a website on that with information? The the federal uh, site that would be related to it, or at least a. A, uh, a website that would give information about that project? If I just put it in the comments, then I'll find the actual um, federal website. Okay, that'd be great because, um, I, I, and uh, Kendra, you're on the line, right? Yes, I'm here. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Krista to copy you on that to to send that to me and copy you on that, and I'd like to get that up on our website in some way. Just as a, as an information point, if nothing else, we'll make sure to add these links to our follow up on our website, um, so they're available to everyone. That most recent one is very interesting to me, and I appreciate you sharing that with us, Krista. That that's one that we should be following, um, and I wasn't aware of it, so terrific. Um, yes, and then also I was going to ma um, mention um, that in the farm bill, um, the most recent farm bill, um, there were, let me pull this information up, um, I believe at least six mentions of waste, food waste reduction in that farm bill. Well, good. That's good. Um, <laughs> Uh, to, uh, to what end, I guess, would be my question. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I can't tell you right now, um, but I definitely think it's, it, it, I love to, to see that the federal government is, and 
all of our administrators are really starting to put this top of mind. I usually, I also believe that once you start seeing this in legislation, as well as team ups, like we were talking about, funding typically follows behind it to support the initiative, neither conversion, diversion, um, or whatever initi initiatives come up. Yeah, I, I remain vitally interested in the way uh, uh, rhetoric is translated into actual action and then how that action is then translated into impact. In other words, very often we'll see at various levels of the government, both uh, national, state, even countywide, um, commitments or rhetoric that's shared that seems positive and constructive in some way. Then the next question is, to what extent is the constructive rhetoric, like we have to reduce the waste stream, we have to do more to, uh, you know, uh, repurpose food or um, help local farmers, whatever the rhetoric might be. Then the next question is, is, how much funding then is being put into that? And then how is that funding then distributed to the folks on the ground that could actually make a difference? And that continues to be an interest of mine. And notoriously difficult to track. And that's just an observation. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%. So if we get, if we're aware of it now, that's great. And um, when you send us that information, we'll be sure to get it up on the website about that federal initiative, which sounds exciting. I mean, it's just wonderful to see all those different parts, branches of the federal government coming together. Uh, that suggests some sort of momentum. And uh, we'll just have to stay tuned, I guess, to see what comes of it. Absolutely. All right. Well, according to my clock, we only have two minutes left. Any last questions from from our audience? Okay. Well, in the two minutes that remain, I want to thank David and Krista for an outstanding presentation, uh, dynamic and engaged and engaging, and appreciate everyone that was online participating uh, in this forum. I'm going to ask, as we reach the close of our session for today, I'm going to remind everyone that a copy of this, an actual electronic voice transcript of this, will be posted online. Correct, uh, Kendra? Yes, it will. And I also want to remind everyone that Florida Food Policy Council hosts the Florida Food Forum every month. Next month, Kendra, remind me of our date. I think we're changing it from our usual date, which is the last Friday of the month. I think we're changing it next month to what day? It will be on December 20th, uh, the third Friday okay. uh, from 12 to 1 o'clock. Okay. And Kendra, very briefly, the topic's going to be to share? Food policy for wellness. Food policy for wellness, um, December, December 20th. And then in, uh, starting in January, we'll return to our regular uh, last Friday of the month for our food forums. Please tell other folks about the forum. Please encourage folks to call in and be part of this. This is a way to become dynamically involved, each and every one of us, in Florida Food Policy and the Florida Food Policy Council. On behalf of the council, I want to thank everyone for participating. And, Kendra, if you have any last remarks, please share at this time. Just thank you again to everyone and also uh, for the Treasure Coast Food Bank for presenting today. It was a wonderful presentation. It certainly was. And thank you all again. And we'll, we'll uh, see you again next month or at least hear from you next month. Bye now. Bye. Bye-bye.